they said God is a reflection of paradise, others said it's a metaphor of paradise, and other scholars they said God can generally be considered a representation of the heaven and earth. And the specific connection between God is the paradise started with the Muslim began to use it at the second point. So these are really quick uh, views from different perspectives, but these are the majority perspectives. In the course of Islamic history, God was suited aside from constructing the mosque. The intention for creating the mosque in a garden site could be for its symbolic, its spiritual meaning, and for its functional value. One of the earliest examples of see the mosque is constructed here, uh, constructed in existing garden of the edges of the site is the prophet So beside building mosque in or near garden city, uh, city, there were also a tendency to garden the courtyard of the mosque. Those garden courtyards are often planted with trees and, uh, and contain water features used for irrigation and production. For example, we have the great Pictorial representation of nature and gardens are also a common feature in early mosques. The most worn and columns are often decorated with music, stucco, flora, and naturalistic features. For example, the great uh, mosque of Damascus has this linear exit from the last one, or this is the representation of the and landscape. So, just to summarize these three points, we have three categories of focus on the the first one we have a mosque built on a garden site. The second one is a mosque built on the courtyard. And the third one is a mosque with no actual garden, but the great uh, natural and garden. And I talk about this in the The rest of my presentation will highlight some modern examples. So these examples are from history. So we will continue this uh, exploration of modern This one is situated within an urban landscape. The, court, the mosque has a series of courtyards, small courtyards, all are connected together, and it's open to a larger courtyard in the back, uh, which is designed also now in a charbagh style. And I'm sorry, I don't have more images, but you can see on the right side, there is a, uh, the courtyard, the charbagh, and water features, and this is the entrance of the mosque. And I would like to add here some information that these courtyards, uh, they provide a spaces for socializing and decorated also with, uh, with patches, standard patches. And they were designed to provide also cooling and uh, refreshing environment inside the, inside the mosque. The next example is the Kingi Plaza and also the The Kindi Plaza in Riyadh is also one of the famous examples. And this example showing us how the mosque is connected to the urban fabric. The mosque is designed in a Najdi style, so we can see the landscaping is also reflecting that. There is no much trees, there is mostly uh, 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 paving. But at the same time, this is space provide a socializing space uh, for, the, uh, for the people of
The next example is the Grand National uh, Assembly Mosque in Ankara. It's situated within a large natural style park and has two formal gardens on its north and south side. This is also a famous uh, mosque. Uh, this, this design of the mosque because it's unusual. You can see this topographical and terraces style uh, mosque. It's really connected to the landscape. It has both uh, a, a courtyard, uh, sorry, uh, yes, a courtyard, and there is a in the back there is a sunken bar. I don't have a plan for the landscape. If you had, you can see how the building is really merged with the landscape. I also have an example, a really recent example, the King of Petroleum Studies and Research Center uh, in Riyadh. And you can see again the same concept is repeating itself. The mosque is situated within a linear curve. So we have this trend going on. It's really work with the, the rest of the landscape. And the, and the city that we did. I'm not going to talk about the architecture. Everyone knows about the architecture and the details uh, about how they made the building, and it's very beautiful. You can read about it. I'm, I'm trying to focus on the landscape. The Al Khan. The Al Khan has sponsored many Islamic centers around the world, including in London, Bernabe, Dubai. Toronto, these centers are defined usually as religious, social, and cultural places uh, designated for the Smiley community. Gardens are an essential feature in by traditional Islamic gardens. For example, the Smiley Center in London, and I was lucky that I got a tour uh, to the Smiley Center. On the top roof, they have a beautiful small garden designed in a Chahabad style. So this is also something new about Islamic gardens. Usually we see it in the building, but in this case we have the garden on the rooftop. Today with the growing number of Muslim in diaspora, more mosques are being built, representing a collective Islamic ethic and cultural identity. One recent example is the Cambridge Mosque, and again, everyone knows about it. The mosque has a garden design, designed as a modern interpretation of classical paradise. So we can see the building here. So this is the building, and we have a small Ismaili, uh, sorry, small Islamic garden in the front. I, I met the, uh, the designer, I interviewed her, Emma Clark, and she talked about how she designed the garden. We have this mosque is uh, really in a, in, a, in a major road. People are moving around. So she wanted to make the Islamic garden the entrance of this. So people like get that. It's a, so it's like a transitional space between the mosque and the crowded area. So the message that I'm trying to send here in this my, my paper that with the mosque architecture, we saw both continuity and change. We saw a lot of examples the last, last day and today that how Islamic architecture, the mosque, is evolving. Changes in the material, in the form. And with that, also the garden is continuing to change and evolve. But research on this part of, the, of this element is really uh, limited. That's why I'm trying to encourage the scholars to, to focus also on the garden. Thank you so much. The rest and details is all in the paper. Please read it. Thank you so much. So there is, so there is no moderator. If you have any question, please go ahead. Thank you for le your lecture. I actually wrote my question, so I don't forget. Um, my question isn't directly related to the paper itself, but uh, do you believe that the pictorial representation of the gardens and the mosques 
uh, represent, I mean, in form of mo mosaic or, or motif. Do you believe that it represents the Jannah, actually? Because uh, from my readings, and, and, uh, they were all um, uh, 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 from the opinion of the Orientals, you know, and they see, it, they, they debate that uh, the pictorial uh, works don't represent the actual uh, landscape, you know, so that they, they assume that it represents the Jannah, and I want your impression as an Arabic scholar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. This is a really good question about the pictorial representation that we see in a lot of mosques. And this example is from Damascus mosque, so it's a really old example. And you are right. Uh, the, the meaning of this is from the mind of the researcher, because we don't have the actual artist who can tell us exactly why this was built, or how, what exactly they were referring. But from the historical Okay, so this is my answer to your question. I can I can guarantee you, like yeah. f you can think about this as a different but from this per different yeah. perspective, yeah. but from the literature, this is what I think. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Asira Baba. I'm coming from Jordan. Uh, I finished my master's degree from the Hashemite University in Jordan, and uh, right now I'm working as a part-time lecturer at the Jordanian University of Science and Technology. Uh, our paper uh, was represented by me and my supervisor uh, at the uh, master's degree, Dr. Shada Abu Khafaja. Uh, she is specified in uh, heritage and uh, historical uh, and history of architecture. Uh, we derived this paper from my thesis. Uh, the title is uh, The Mosque as a Political Platform. Uh, so we are going to uh, uh, going through the political uh, presentation of mosque architecture and how does it uh, change through the time. And then uh, we are covering the Islamophobia and uh, the reflection of Islamophobia in mosque architecture and how does it reshape the mosque architecture in the contemporary age. Uh, okay, I covered that already. Uh, so, as an introduction, the architectural practice uh, 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 require uh, uh, having a, uh, a powerful architectural practice usually requires a powerful nation. Uh, so, uh, getting a powerful a powerful nation uh, uh, requires the three main aspects: a political aspect or a very polit uh, a very powerful political aspect, cultural aspect, and economic economical aspect. So, uh, in light of Islam, uh, we can see we can see that um, at the time when when Islam uh, was politically uh, powerful and uh, it were uh, it was mainly the uh, uh, the the main Islamic khilafats or regimes. Uh, the uh, uh, they give a lot of attention to uh, the uh, uh, the presentation of mosques as it is the main or the most important building in uh, in the Islamic city. Uh, so a great interest was given to the monumental mosques and its standard in the, dif in the contrast with what, uh, what was happening at the Prophet era. But as we know, the Prophet era was one of the, uh, wasn't, was before uh, the, uh, the political power of, uh, of Islam. Uh, but uh, however, uh, mosque architecture has always influenced by the, uh, by the countries they conquered. So when he, when they conquered a country, they start uh, introducing their power by building a, a, pol a mosque or a very uh, political mosque that uh, represent an Islamic uh, political territory at the region. <laughs> Uh, the style of this mosque was always un influenced by the Concord country uh, architectural style. Uh, Umayyads have always been uh, influenced by the Byzantine architecture. Uh, they all they added most of the elements to the uh, to the Islamic architecture, and they continue using the hypostyles which was used during the uh, Prophet era. Uh, while uh, the Abbasid were influenced by the Persian architecture, and they introduced and founded the 41 mosques. Uh, looking at the Uthman, uh, they founded the centralized mosques, uh, the mosque architecture reached its peak its speak during this, uh, this era, and it was influenced by the Christian architecture. Uh, the existence of mosques in modern Europe, I'm talking about modern Europe, which means uh, by the end of, uh, or 
uh, during the Uthman and modern and modern existence of Muslims in Europe, we can say that uh, even though that uh, mosques were introduced to the to the European uh, context during the eighth century and the Uthman uh, Empire, uh, but we can say that in the first ever mosque in the in the modern Europe was the Woking Mosque, which located at London. Uh, it is uh, it is designed as a small rectangular mosque that. Uh, that approximately cover, covering uh, an area of 330 square meters. Uh, this mosque represents a high, a high uh, clarification of the political, uh, the political and cultural ties between India and, the, and England, as the mosque represents a, a small version or um, a small version of Mughal architecture, which was uh, which was mainly uh, centralized or founded in uh, India. Uh, the mosque uh, presence in Europe expanded more and more after the uh, post World War World War One, uh, as World War One uh, found. Um, Spread the industrial industrial revolution and the need for labor, uh, which uh, increased the in, uh, increased the Muslim population due to migration movements and increased uh, the founding of mosques in Europe. Uh, however, mosques are still till now an alien feature in the modern Europe uh, context. Uh, the influential factors in designing mosques in modern Europe. First of all, the multicultural background of Muslims, as Muslims coming from different backgrounds and different identities, which influenced the styles of mosques based on uh, the category or the uh, or the group that uh, that funds and represent the mosque. Uh, the funding bodies. Most of the mosques are funded by different uh, different associations and different uh, different bodies. Also, it uh, it's mainly by the put, uh, the petrol uh, the petrodollar countries. Uh, so the architectural preferences of the major funder usually affects the production of this uh, of the mosque. Uh, regulation and laws. Some people, uh, some countries, uh, put restrictions in mosque architecture to control the visibility of Islam. Uh, even though uh, during our age, uh, these restrictions uh, contains the banning of most, uh, the banning of minarets, the banning of uh, domes, uh, which uh, which mainly influence the production of mosque architecture in these countries. Uh, looking at the recent age, we can say that Islamophobia has a, an influential factor, is one of the influential factors of presenting mosques or uh, shaping and constructing mosques in, uh, in Europe. The 9-11 uh, happened in the, United, uh, in the United States, but its reflections uh, was, uh, uh, was mainly founded in uh, Western Europe. So uh, the Islamophobia derived a new phenomena that was uh, most or let's say 9-11 uh, increased the Islamophobia phenomena. Uh, what derived uh, a new phenomena called mosque phobia. The mosque phobia separated, subjected, and limited the mosque role in worldwide and mainly in Europe. 9/11, uh, as I said, it was uh, it, it derived the mosque phobia or uh, increased the mosque phobia, which derived the mo uh, sorry derived the mosque phobia. Uh, this was uh, was linked with uh, the Arab Spring and the rising of Muslims number and po and Muslim populations in Europe. Uh, this uh, uh, this th at this time, uh, Muslims in Europe are asking to rechange the styles of uh, of mosques uh, because uh, of the unacceptance of the mos uh, the islamic uh, presence in europe so uh, they need uh, they were asking to uh, and calling for focusing on the primary role at uh, on the primary role of mosques at the time of islamophobia in order to reduce the attacks they, they uh, that they uh, usually uh, in do, uh, they that they usually uh, targeted because of uh, the the visibility and the presence of mosques in the uh, in this context. Uh, the three, uh, the reshaping of mosques uh, in the present in the present age is happening in three approaches. The first approach is denying or uh, or keeping the conventional style of mosque architecture and keeping uh, the conventional presentation of mosques in the. Uh, in the present age, as what we can say, as what we can see at Al Fatih Mosque in France, uh, the second is partly deviated with which to try to integrate between the needs of the society. Sorry, the needs of the society and 
the needs of the society and uh, and uh, the uh, the current time or the current uh, situation. So they are trying to uh, to find. Uh, let's say to hold the state uh, to hold the stake from the center and find uh, a way to uh, connect with the community without uh, losing the identity of uh, of the mosque and the th and the final one is a total deviation or a total uh, moving away from uh, an abstraction to mosque architecture and presenting a new forms of mosques that uh, doesn't have an any uh, relation to the identity uh, to the identity of mosque architecture and that uh, as uh, the color Mosque in Germany. Uh, a discussion was open through this as if it affects the sacredness and the uh, spiritual aspects of mosques. Uh, uh, I think that, or our paper covered that uh, the sacredness of mosque lies beyond its architecture. However, the architecture is uh, is uh, representing; it doesn't affect its sacredness. Uh, some of the spiritual or some of the features that were founded through the history uh, were connect were highly connected uh, to uh, the uh, perception of uh, of people of mosques, and it uh, it actually has a nostalgic dimension to uh, to what uh, to to what people can understand of the mosque or how can they perceive the mosque. So uh, th these features as dome and special uh, mm -hmm. shapes of domes and, and minarets. Uh, however, uh, reshaping the traditional mosque might, might, might be resisted through uh, some of, uh, of people, but it, it, in another side, it can be a need to bridge the gap between the Western society and uh, or the Islamophobic societies and, uh, and the uh, others or as what I call it, the others uh, who are now uh, trying to get a way to uh, to cope up with the uh, with these communities, so it can bond uh, the uh, the relations and tie the relations between the uh, uh, Western Western societies and the new Islamic societies that they are coming. Uh, the bond, however, also the bond between the visibility of uh, mosques and the spiritual aspects should not be underestimated, but it can be, uh, it can be converted to help and uh, to save the spiritual aspects of these mosques. As can be found in uh, Beit al Rauf Mosque, they actually abstracted most of the features that we uh, that we know, like the minarets and the dome. But at the same time, they uh, they they could play with how the light in the light enters them, uh, this uh, the hall, and they saved the spiritual aspect of the mosque, even though nothing of the uh, of the known and well known and well used uh, sp uh, conventional features are uh, are are presented or are uh, already constructed in this mosque. Conclusions, as we, uh, as I said, uh, September 11 marked a different uh, mark a different level of Islamophobia, featured by uh, hate crimes and uh, hate crimes against Muslims and attacks. Uh, the reshaping of typical mosque promotes uh, promotes the bridging uh, uh, for bridging the gap between Muslims and uh, and the and the Western societies. Uh, apart from the Qibla, there is no more no specifications uh, of uh, no specifications or religious specifications about the requirements of mosque architecture uh, and the physical restrictions. Uh, so, however, the mosque is uh, presented, it, can, it cannot be affect its uh, spirituality or its sacredness. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? The one I'll try to focus on is related to the Western mosque. And I yeah. think you talked about the European mosque. I think you brought a, a kind of a good idea about how things are happening in relation to Islamophobia. But yeah. I think the kind of a little bit of generalization about Europe makes it uh, not very clear which countries or which side of the countries you are talking about. Yeah. Coming from the UK context, because there is a major, kind of a big majority of Indian, uh, yeah. Pakistani and uh, Bangladesh society there, or community there, there are 
uh, we have a lot of presence in mosques, for example. Yeah. Cities like Leicester, for example, has at least 25 mosques. Yeah. So there is kind of, there is differences happening or variation between one country. You compare this to France, for example, you will find this a lot of variation. Yeah. But I think a more focused kind of approach to different variations within Europe can be helpful as well. Yeah. So thank you for that. I, I want to just comment on that. Uh, uh, at the paper, we focused, uh, we already have some statistics about uh, the hate attacks. And we found that uh, Germany and France are the most, uh, uh, the most country with Islamophobic attacks and hate attacks. So uh, when we talk about uh, Western Europe, I'm, I, I focused already on uh, Germany and France. Uh, about the UK, I know that there is a major, uh, a major mo Muslims in, uh, in UK and and they can live peacefully uh, in in UK. So I think um, it's not. What, I I don't I don't remember. I already read it, and that it is one of the hot top uh, Islamophobic countries. I think it's, it's important to cover the differences yeah. because it has its own problems as well. Being yeah. Kind of a different community or a minority within a bigger majority. But I think a differentiation between what's happening in different countries can be important as well. Thank you. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for, for your talk. As, as um, Dr. Yasser said, you, you spread on uh, and you talked about very different topics that actually um, did not allow me to focus on one topic. So it was kind of scattered. Anyway, I, I disagree with you in, uh, on different points. First of all, um, uh, when, when you talked, uh, first, first uh, slide, when you talked about um, power nation means... Um, powerful um, practice. If I go back to Ibn Khaldun, he says the, 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 the contrary to this. He's, he's in, in um, opposition to what you said. When the country declines in its power, it tends to um, um, go more luxurious in its architecture. Mm -hmm. And this is the situation where the monumental architecture show off. Because they say, يميلوا إلى الراحة والترف. So then the, the, the caliphs at that time, they tended to build that type of architecture. Yani, uh, you feel that those very big monumental architecture came out in Islamic history when the country or when the caliphates were in their declining stages. This is fair. Second, when you talked about um, the Abbasid, that they are the, 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 the dynasty which introduced the, the four Iwans, uh, Mosques, this is not correct. It's the Ayyubid who introduced the four Iwans kind of in, in, uh, in uh, Cairo because they want to um, go to um, Madrasa with the four um, um, rites, the Madahib al Arba. Yeah. So they, they borrowed from, uh, from the Persian the four Iwans. Plus, the Ottomans actually were influenced by the Byzantine, not the Persians. No, and they were Byzantine by Christian architecture. Christian architecture, yeah. the Byzantine, yes. So uh, just a few, few, a few uh, things here, here and there. Uh, the third point is that regarding um, the abstraction of, of mosque architecture, you try to show that abstraction is kind of um, a political effect, a result because of the political pressure just to hide the identity kind of the Islamic, um, direct Islamic um, uh, um, Visibility. symbols, yeah. and then it is kind of a result because of that political effect, which is not true. I mean, the, 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 the workshops today and yesterday, they tried Dr. Muhammad and Hassan al-Din Khan to show that it is, again, I mean, it is going um, um, in contrary to the, the concept of regionalism. So we are now going into universalism. And this is even uh, appearing or, or happening in the Arab countries as well. So there is no political issue in, in uh, applying that concept into Arabic countries as well. So that direct relationship was kind of flawed for me. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, just can I, can I explain something uh, about the Arab world? Uh, as we know that uh, globalization has its has its effect also in the uh, in this in the identity or the style of architecture uh, the globalization and the global vision of uh, of uh, of the cities is 
can be related to a political uh, dimension, I think. Okay. Yes, uh, I'd just like to add to this that I think you both have some very good points here, and I'm going to be talking about Islamophobia in American yeah. mosques soon after this. And I, in my interviews with members of the community, I find both of these to be true, right? There's this movement towards universalism and this concern about Islamophobia. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we can also see the, the sort of multiplicity of reasons why people might make these choices, and they're not always a, a homogenous effort. So I appreciate thinking about both of these together. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. So I'll take a selfie. I'm so worried about the interview. I understand that this is a part of the topic, a large topic you spoke about in your thesis. So and I understand you are try, trying to abbreviate everything. But as we discussed before, um, I think when you when you use uh, uh, the word uh, or the terminology deviation, you need to set up the zero point. I mean, yeah, deviated from <laughs> what, what part, what era, what time, and what uh, location? Because mm -hmm. uh, you are speaking about uh, Europe and about uh, actually some Arabic countries. So that's only the only point I I need to make. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Any questions? Asa? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for attending. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, my presentation is in Arabic. Sorry, my paper is in Arabic, but uh, I was reluctant whether to do the presentation in English or in Arabic. But when I see uh, some people here who are non-Arabic speaking, then in last minute I decided to, to try to do it in English. Okay, hopefully it works. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Jihad Awad. I'm the head of architecture department at Ajman University in uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates. Um, my presentation will be about mosques in Ajman city. We have in United Arab Emirates, we have Ajman Emirate and Ajman city. Ajman Emirate is the smallest emirate in United Arab Emirates. And this study is part of, my presentation is like a kind of summary for a, a larger study about mosques in the northern four emirates. Uh, which are Sharjah, Ajman, Umm al and Ras al Khaimah. But today I will be focusing on Ajman city, okay, the mosques in Ajman city. Why? Because we found out that it represents or it summarizes the uh, ongoing uh, debate and discussion all over the Islamic world about the issue of the architecture of mosques and how it's related to the historical styles, especially the, the mosques that are built after 2000, okay? Which I will be calling it now here modern mosques. I know it might be confusion, you know. Um, one of the guests here one day asked me, Jihad, what do you mean by modern mosques? <laughs> what I mean here simply is those mosques that are built or that have been built after the year 2000, okay? now. Uh, in the last few years in Ajman, uh, there is a trend to build more mosques, new mosques, modern mosques, especially during the last yeah, four or five years. We can, we can probably, without exaggerating, we can say that uh, every year almost 50 mosques, 50 new mosques are being built. And in our study, um, our study is never finished because Wherever we go in Ajman, we find a new mosque under construction. And we found out that there is a diversity, huge diversity. It appears that it's a huge diversity between the styles of mosques. So we said, okay, let's make a study to understand what are the differences between these mosques and what are the common things. Uh, and as usual, according to previous studies, in other places of the Islamic world, 
it remains the same issue, the same debate, the same discussion. How far we have to inspire or to get or to copy or to imitate, you know, elements or ideas from historical styles and how far we have to depart from these historical mosques. So this is mainly, I think, almost in, in all cities in the Islamic world. Uh, I will try to go quickly in these slides, okay, because I know that for architects it might be boring to read yani, all this text, so I will try to go fast uh, to reach some figures or some photos, but I will highlight some of the points here. Um, Mosques in Ajman are managed by Hayat al Awqaf or Shun uh, Islamiyya, okay, well, Awqaf. Shortly we say Al Awqaf. Now, they have a document in Arabic. Uh, anyone who wants, any donor, let's say, who wants to build a mosque or to finance building a mosque, he has to get the approval of the Awqaf first. He goes or she goes to a consultant office. They prepare the plans, the drawings, the design, and then it has to be submitted to the Awqaf. The Awqaf has to approve it first, according to uh, this document that I will be talking about it, okay? It's in Arabic, one page, and it deals mainly with the general layout of the mosque to make sure that the orientation is correct towards Kaaba, towards Kubla, and the location of the mosque. You know, uh, plus they have some specific points. Uh, the general one, they say that the style of the mosque should be according to the uh, traditional Islamic architecture and preferably to be according to the traditional Emirati architecture. But this is general and you will find many mosques, they don't follow exactly this point, okay? So they don't, they don't, how can I say, they, they don't implement this condition strictly, the awqaf. They focus more on other things. The number of ablution places, the number of uh, WC toilets, okay? Uh, they have like uh, standards per, for example, per 100 uh, worshippers, there should be one ablution place, no, one, one toilet. And for uh, every 30 worshippers, there should be one ablution place. And also they insist that there should be a house for the imam, okay? Two or three rooms, separated from the building of the mosque. And also they prefer that the toilets and ablution areas should be separated from the building of the mosque. Some minor conditions, they, they add that, especially in larger mosques, you know, those mosques that are 800 square meter and, and more, uh, there should be, or they prefer to have a smaller prayer hall before the main prayer hall. For the daily prayers during the week, not for the Friday prayer, for the daily prayers, they pray, they use this uh, front hall, we call it, and the larger hall, the main hall, is used mainly during the Friday prayer. Uh, here, you can see in Arabic some of these conditions. Uh, they prefer the, the layout for the prayer hall to be either square or rectangle. And when it's rectangle, the longer side should be the Qibla wall. Okay, where the mihrab is in the middle of that wall. Um, they also prefer um, a prayer hall without columns, yani, or uh, to the minimum, as much as possible, to reduce the number of columns or supports in the prayer hall, within the prayer hall. Uh, for the women prayers area, they suggest mostly that to be on the side of the main prayer hall, okay, or in an upper level, a mezzanine, okay? 
and it's a must. It's a must for the uh, the Jamia mosques. Yani for for mosques that are more than 800 square meter, you know, they insist that there should be a women uh, prayer area. For larger mosques that are more than 1,000 square meter, in addition to the imam's mosque, uh, imam's house, sorry, imam's house, they also uh, request uh, a place for the haris or, uh, what do you call it, housekeeper or whatever, or the mu'adhin even. Here, I mean, this is a kind of summary for the um, conditions or the, the how, how the main prayer hall should be. For the uh, minarets, um, we found out that most of the mosques, I'm talking about the mosques that are built after 2000, most of the mosques have only one, one uh, minaret and there is no specific place for the location of that minaret. Um, we have some mosques with two minarets, but literally, and a few, not, not, not so many. And the only mosque in Ajman that has four, four minarets is the Sheikh Zayed Mosque. This is the only mosque that has more than two minarets in Ajman. For the domes, we have different types of domes here, as you can see. But uh, the most common domes are um, semicircle in section, you know, yeah, uh, circular, let's say. We have some, some uh, domes that are pointed and uh, only one or two examples with this uh, onion-like uh, dome. And one case with, uh, as you can see, the one that is like uh, Moroccan or uh, Andalusian one, this one. And now they are making renovation for this. I don't know how they will transform this into what shape or they will keep it as it is. I don't know. Still, we are waiting for this. And here uh, talks about the house of the Imam and the Muazzin and the uh, ablution areas and, and toilets. And here are some conditions for the uh, women uh, prayer area. Now, when we come to the courtyard, Al Fina. Unfortunately and sur surprisingly that we found only three or four mosques that have courtyard and not exactly according to the courtyards that we find in historical examples, you know, but still they can be classified as courtyard mosques. Strange yani, that, that it's not so common there, although it's very appropriate for the climate there to have courtyard mosques and they have enough spaces and enough areas for new mosques. Uh, but anyway, this was the case. Uh, the openings and ornamentation. The modern mosques, we notice that they have little or less yani, mm. ornaments and decoration. And by the way, this is also one of the conditions uh, in that document by the Awqaf to reduce as much as possible the ornamentation and uh, whatever, decorative elements. Now, despite all these conditions that are mentioned in the document, um, which uh, yeah, create a kind of unity between these modern mosques, nonetheless, you still find diversity, especially in the appearance, in the external appearance, in the form, in the style of the mosque, um, mainly according to the openings, the form, the composition, you know, you still find lots of differences between these mosques, from traditional to purely modern. So at the end, we were able to classify. I mean, that was our purpose at the end as a conclusion, to classify, to categorize these mosques, okay? Um, into, we found out that we can classify it into three to four groups, the, the modern mosques there. The first one is Tabi'at Taqlidi Mahalli Imarati, P. 
purely traditional Emirati style, but it's newly built, you know, but following and imitating the traditional Emirati style, as you can see here. And we were surprised that, because as I mentioned, this is part of a larger study which covered the four different Emirates, Sharjah, Ajman, Umm al and Ras al -Khaybe. I myself, I was surprised to discover that even the traditional architecture, even the traditional architecture between, between these, yeah, there, there are differences in the traditional architecture, the original architecture, the vernacular architecture, between these four Emirates, although the four Emirates are close to each other and yeah, not far away from each other. But still, we noticed and we observed that there is a kind of differences even in the traditional Emirati architecture in these four Emirates, <laughs> with probably little differences, not that much, you know. So this is the first group. But as you see here, these are, you can see the date between brackets, you know. These are all built after the year 2000. Then the second group, it's inspired by or from uh, historical models or histor historical mosques, uh, not necessarily from UAE, from Emirate. Uh, it could be from other regions like Ottoman, let's say, uh, or Andalusian styles, um, or from previous historical periods, you know, but it's not from Emirate. For example, in Fujairah city, which is not included in this study, there is a mosque which is replica, replica of Sultan, Sultan Ahmed Mosque in Istanbul. Even in Sharjah, a new mosque which was opened, I think, two years ago, it's again a replica of one of the mosques of Sinan. A copy, exact copy. But it's not included here, but maybe you see it in the last slide, you can see a photo for it. Then the third group is Tabe. Sorry. Yeah, Tabe marriage by Minit Taklidi Wal Hadith. Okay. A kind of combination between traditional and modern. Modern using here modern architecture according to the architectural understanding of the word modern, you know. Uh, so it's a kind of combination. This is the second group, which is inspired uh, from um, different styles, from different regions, as you can see here. This is Moroccan or Andalusian style. Here we have only the minarets, by the way, that looks like Ottoman. Only the minarets. The dome, it's only one simple dome here without semi-domes. Um, this one, I don't know. By the way, I myself, until now, I'm confused. I don't know which style is this one. You know, it's a kind of mixture, probably. And this one here uh, with this uh, onion-like uh, dome, you know. Uh, by the way, when we talk about Ottoman, Ajman city is probably, till yesterday, let's say, till yesterday was the only uh, city in UAE that does not have an Ottoman style mosque. We could find Ottoman style mosque in Sharjah, in Umm al Gawain, in Ras al Khaima, in Fujairah, in Al Ain, in Khorfakan, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in all Emirati cities. We found many, several yani, uh, Ottoman uh, style mosques, except in Ajman. But now, almost completed, there is a new mosque still not opened yet, purely Ottoman style. And this is the third type, the third group, let's say, which, which is a kind of uh, mixture between traditional uh, and modern mosques. Uh, this one here, this one, it's in the center of Ajman. It used to have a courtyard here. This area, I remember the animal. Well, this area was a courtyard, front courtyard. Unfortunately, they covered it. 
they covered it recently. Yani two years ago, they covered this one. Uh, this one, we will talk a little bit uh, in more details about this one. It is just next to the palace of the Amir, of the crown prince there. Uh, this one designed by an Iraqi architect, lady Iraqi architect. Uh, <coughs> it's distinguished uh, for its minaret, special one, you know. And it has a courtyard here, a small courtyard with a fountain, this one. Uh, for those who are interested to know the name of the architect here, later on I can say, because she will be presenting also next week online lecture uh, at our university. And this one is a new one, but it, it, yani it, it was inspired by a traditional Emirati style, you know, with uh, look at the minaret. It's purely modern minaret, you know. Even the color here, it, it looks more Emirati. And some parts, the mihrab, even the entrances from the back side, from that side. For this one, this is a kind of special mosque. We will talk about it and we'll show, I will show the plans for it because it has a green area inside the prayer hall, like a garden. They have a garden inside the prayer hall. We will see it in more details later. Now, the fourth and the last group of mosques is purely modern. It has nothing to do with historical styles. So this is the furthest, let's say, a uh, type of mosque that is far away from historical elements at all, as you can see here. And I wonder, if you remove the minaret, will people recognize that these are mosques? We keep asking the same question. Yeah, for example, especially this one. And if you remove the minaret, you know, and if you look at the, you know, from uh, different corners, if you look at the, the mosque, you, you hardly can, can recognize that this is a mosque. Um, even this one, even this one, if you remove the minaret, this is, by the way, in the middle of a housing project. And I don't have another photo that shows that the, the style and the type of house is there. Because if there, if there, if there, if there was no minaret here, you will, you will think that it's similar to other surrounding villas there. Now, I will, I will highlight here two examples, which I believe that are good examples to show how mosques can be, you know, how new mosques and modern mosques can be. This one, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it has uh, mm -hmm. a green area. Look, this is the original plan here. The entrance is from here, from this side. The original plan, in the original plan, the green area inside the prayer hall was supposed to be like this, like U-shape. But during construction, they decided to remove this part, to cancel this part, and this part, to cancel the garden on both sides of the prayer hall. So now what we have here, only this green area, which is behind the mihrab and the member. The member and the mihrab here are like freestanding. Yani while you are while you are praying here, standing pray, praying here, you see the garden here, and this garden is covered by skylights, which bring light from there. And here at the corners of this central dome, as you can see, uh, uh, skylights replaced the the pendentives or the 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 squinches or the um, stalactites, whatever, you know. And by the way, this is from inside. This is here the mihrab and the member. And here, as you can see, the green area. The second example, which is designed by uh, the architect uh, Hal al Madfai. She is uh, an architect, in, originally, she is Iraqi, but she lives in New Zealand. Uh, she designed this one. Uh, mm -hmm famous for its minaret, for this minaret, and with the courtyard. This is a small courtyard preceding the, uh, the, the main entrance to the prayer hall. Hello, I'm a moderator. Mm -hmm. I can decide when to stop, right? <laughs> Cam, how many minutes? OK, less than five minutes. I can finish in less than five minutes, inshallah. Uh, the conclusion, again, I mean, 
we found out that there is a unity within diversity, you know? There is a unity that is created um, because of the conditions, because of that document by the Awqaf, okay? Unity in the layout, in the special organization, you know? Um, in the plan, let's say. And also due to the function. Uh, diversity because there are no strict rules f which I agree with. I mean, there should be a kind of uh, space of freedom, you know, uh, to, to, to design the, the outside um, appearance or the external appearance, you know, from outside. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot do all the mosques the same copy, the same thing from outside. So there was a kind of diversity between, but not, not so how can I say, extreme. Still, in Ajman, we don't see that extreme difference between the very traditional and extreme modern mosques. And when I say modern here, I mean the latest approaches in architecture. For example, deconstructivism. There was a project by Emre Arulat, who was here a few days ago. There was a project for a mosque in the center of Ajman, which is completely deconstructivism. But now, I mean, they didn't implement his design. Now they are um, working on a design which is under construction now for a kind of semi-traditional, semi-modern, which is now being built. Uh, this uh, yeah, and it shows in general how mosques in Ajman are. Um, I, I can say that we can classify or we can put all of them under one type, which is the hypostyle in terms of prayer hall, hypostyle, as you can see. And mm -hmm. um, uh, this is the uh, front hall, smaller one, for daily or for weekly, yeah, for daily, sorry, for daily prayers. And this is like a portico, an entrance area. Here you find ablution and a toilet, which according to the document uh, by Awqaf should be uh, separated from the mosque. And here is the uh, women prayer hall, this one. And this is the house of Imam. Almost all mosques in Ajman follow this scheme here. Recently, we noticed during the last two years, <laughs> A point, I think many of the colleagues here, they tackle this point, uh, that it should be not only for, for worshiping you know, the mosque, it should be for the community, part of the community, part of the neighborhood. Now, we noticed that in the last few years, the last two years mainly, that um, for each mosque, they provide a playing area for kids with seats for families also, just next to the mosque. And even... Uh, uh, sport area, not only for, for uh, small kids, no. Sport area, you can go there for uh, the youth. Yani they can go and play, you know, football, basketball, uh, volleyball, whatever, next to the mosque, mm -hmm. as you can see here. Halas? Can I slide with I? I think, OK, I will go quickly through it, sorry. Yani. They can read it. It's all in the book, you know. <laughs> the whole paper is in the book, Yani. Uh, I feel sorry for the uh, non-Arab speaker, Yani, that they cannot read it in Arabic. But there is an English similar, similar version, you know, in English, which has been published in one of the issues in Archnet IJAR, a journal, a well-known journal. It's called Archnet IJAR. It's published there, you know. Uh, one of the points that is really interesting there, as you can see here, there are so many mosques that have the same plan and the same design, and only very, very, very little differences, such as the minaret, sometimes on the left, other times on the right. It was even difficult for me when I was conducting this study. I was always confused. Did I visit that mosque or not? And when I reach it, I either find out that I already visited this, or I'm surprised that, no, I didn't visit it, you know? But they look the same, look, it, they have the same plan and the same design. 
Of course, there are reasons for that. Now, this is a kind of summary. I will, I will finish yani, my presentation with this, okay? I will not yani, continue, but this is a kind of summary for these types, as you can see. Um, the first group, which is this one, traditional. Here you see the plan. And this is uh, historical, I call it, or inspired from historical examples. And here, uh, mixed, yani, uh, historical with modern uh, elements. And this one is purely modern. OK, traditional X-rays are extra images. This is for people who speak English. But this is a summary for the larger study which covers the four emirates. This is not only Ajman. This is the, halas, I finished. No, I finished. This is the last, the last one, OK? So here, local, traditional. Uh, examples are not from, only from Ajman. They are here from the four emirates, the examples that you see here. Oh, sorry. The examples that you see here are from the four emirates, not only from Ajman, OK? So for example, this is in Emil Gowen. This is in Ras Al Khaimah. This is in Ajman. This is in Ajman. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Fadali. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Doctor Zainab Hassan Raouf, from the Office of Science and Technology, from Baghdad. ممكن أسأل السؤال باللغة العربية أو اللغة العربية أفضل لي حتى بالألماني إذا بدك أوكي ثانك يو عندي تساؤل بعرضك المميز للنماذج المتعددة وماني ستايلز إن عجمان هل تعتقد هل حيكون أكو العجمان هوية معينة؟ هوية تأسسها المساجد إحنا نعرف المدن الإسلامية دائما تأخذ هويتها من المساجد مالتها وارتفاعات المينارات والستايل معين كل مدينة إسلامية تمتلك ستايل معين سواء كان من نشوف المينارات مالتها مثلا الطراز الفاطمي كانت منارة تمتلك ستايل الطراز المملوكي الطراز العباسي الأموي العثماني فإذا كان الستايل تعددت ماني ستايلز إن عجمان هل سيكون للمدينة هوية معينة هذا دا أتساءله يعني حتكون أنا أعتقد خصوصا بالنماذج اللي أبسترك very أبسترك اللي هي اللي موجودة الوايت وان اللي عرضتها حضرتك دا أشوف إنه حيكون هنالك المدينة تتسم بطابع هجين متعدد اللغات تفتقد لهوية ميزها كمدينة إسلامية أنا هذا رأيي ولو أنا بالضد يعني من الالتزام بعناصر معينة لعمارة المساجد okay. لأنه التطور الحاصل بالوقت المعاصر وما تتيح إمكانات التكنولوجية أوكي نبدأ حق طيارتي أوكي go ahead no problem بط يعني هل تعتقد حيكون إلها هوية thank you أوكي أنت سؤالك عن أعتقد ولا my expectation what will happen there أوكي what's your expectation أوكي إذا بدك أعتقد لا خليني أحكي عن أعتقد Expectation, no one can expect anything there. Yeah. Okay, sorry to say this, but anyways. Uh, because e even to see, by the way, I did not show you some of the extreme cases, which neither you nor I can expect it, you know? We have something like Safinit Nuh, which is under construction now. And, and the, 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 mihrab, the mihrab is at, at the top of this, Safina, you know, which means that the first row can be only two or three worshippers standing there, which is the narrowest, the narrowest, you know, row of, of uh, come on, Faltina, uh, Khalina. So no one can expect such things to happen. Anyways, the point, in my opinion, in my opinion, your question should be not limited only to Ajman or to UAE. This is a general question everywhere in the Islamic world. My personal opinion is that I believe that we can never have a specific style or type. Why? Because I believe architecture and part of it mosques reflects the culture and the society. Our culture is, as you mentioned, and you said, as you said, the, the term, you use the term, hybrid. Our culture is hybrid. Our life is hybrid. We all know this. 
We believe in things and we do other things. I think we all know this, you know. So our built environment, our architecture, including mosques, will definitely reflect this kind of, I will say, a kind of contradiction sometimes, you know. يعني إحنا we we talk about historical styles as nostalgia, you know. We like to see it. If I ask you a question, would you would you accept to go and live in a courtyard house in the middle of Baghdad? If you accept, your children will not accept. صح. The same thing. You can ask the people in UAE or in Kuwait or in any place in the Gulf region. You know. They like courtyard houses, historical courtyard houses. They are proud of it. They restore it. They renovate it. You know, in Sharjah, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Bastakiya, whatever. But if you ask any Emirati there, okay, why don't you come back and live there? He will not accept. If you ask me, I might not accept to live there. So, I hope I I I, I answered part of your question. خلاص شكرا. Oh, thank you. So that's why, uh, as a result, I want to quickly, you know, go over this in ten minutes. Um, so if you, Dr. Muhammad, don't mind, because even though the, he is the main initiator and uh, doing a lot of work, because as he is a formal teacher, so I'm going to present. So if you don't mind, so forgive me. So quickly, I will say, I show this in the morning, talk about how Islam went to China in two different paths. Um, and of course, this same paths have a different kind of like, uh, uh, bring different architecture feature to China compared to the land, which is the Silk Road. I think many people heard the Silk Road from Central Asia. Um, there are three types of the uh, Moscow style in China. The first one is, of course, everyone talk about uh, you know, those two days, about uh, the Middle East style. The second one, I just mentioned this morning, the Chinese style, you know, Moscow. That's two, right? But if they consider there are a couple, mom and dad, they get the children. <laughs> this is the third one. When these two combine together, they have a children. It's a very interesting one. So that's the third one. Third one. I don't, I, I don't think many people know this. The Chinese and the Islamic, I mean Middle East, uh, merged. It's a marriage. The outcome of the marriage, the children. So, um, but of course, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about the, the one of the Chinese one. So again, the site is in Xi'an. Uh, I mentioned this morning, it's in central China, one of the old, uh, very old, uh, long traditional city with uh, a thousand years of history. And again, this is a site. Um, let me see if that works. Yes. You can see this is the old city town. This city wall was built in the 15th century, and it's still there. And if you go to China, uh, Xi'an next time, you should definitely visit this city wall. So this is the Xi'an city until early 20th century. And if you see, this is, a, 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 this is something going on. This is a railroad station, the new Xi'an railroad station. And my, my college classmate is a chief architect of that. Uh, this is something not related to my presentation, but I have to say, uh, because the urban uh, opportunities in China, all my classmates stay, choose stay in China, become millionaires and billionaires, not just the millionaires, billionaires. And I become the poorest one when I choose uh, taking my career in the US. So I'm the, I'm the lost, uh, lost one. No exaggeration, this is the truth. This is truth. Um, one of my classmates, uh, his design firm went to Shanghai store market uh, five years ago. Now he get uh, 2,000 employees. And he was my roommate. <laughs> so now this is the uh, neighborhood I talked about this morning, about uh, the uh, traditional Muslim neighborhood. And uh, this is the mosque we are going to talk about. The oldest and also the largest uh, Asian mosque in China. So here you can see, this is something I asked uh, Muhammad uh, yesterday. Can you read it? this is Arabic? No. But uh, for Chinese, we read it as Arabic. For Arabics, you read it as Chinese. I think that is a tricky part of this mosque. And uh, that's the marriage of the different elements come together. 
So now we just quickly introduce why we're doing this study. We will try to understand the symbolic meaning of the courtyard. I know because we are going to take a lunch, so I'm not going to talk about a lot of complicated urban forms or spatial forms. We just focus on courtyard. And we do a lot of like a three kind of like a research method. I will skip that part, that's boring, right? Nobody will care about your research method. They care about what you bring the research funding. Um, so now let me quickly introduce this mosque. They got a five courtyard here. Um, it's a lot of ch traditional Chinese elements. It's a to choose the traditional Chinese architectural elements as the Islamic expression. And this is a floor plan. Um, this is a background, basic background. It's very old. You can see that this mosque has over thousand years, I think about 1,500 years old history. But of course, it has been destroyed so many times and rebuilt many times. The current one was built in the 18th century. Uh, this is the size and also the layout and also served for over 60 uh, Muslims in this region. What? Yeah, I know, I know. But anyway, this is some of the uh, major landmark in each of the, it's a very interesting, in each of the courtyard, they got uh, some of the important uh, buildings over there. So here is just a, a very simple, quick introduction about how the features within those five courtyards. So, um, it's very interesting because we talk about the Moscow buildings every day, and I think this is the original mosque, right? Open courtyard, just, but just one courtyard. So this courtyard provides a multi-function for public life of the uh, Muslim to, I, I talk about it today, is a shared identity through shared experience. That is exactly how the courtyard in this original mosque is about. And because of that, all other mosques, no matter if built in modern time or older time, they have the same language, courtyard. I think we have the previous presenter also mentioned courtyard, right? So that is the Middle East style. But now, let me quickly say the major difference between the Chinese architectural approach and the Western architectural approach is we call the segregation versus aggregation. So that means in Western architecture, when you have more building functions, the first response is to make this building bigger. So that means increase the size to accommodate the increased complexity of the space, particular function. So the result will be the building will become bigger and bigger and bigger. But in the Chinese way, it's a, instead of like increase the building size, it's a repeat the units. So the outcome is uh, we are going to have not just a one bigger building, rather we get a group of buildings, but they all have the relatively small scale. So this is a very big difference between the Western and the Eastern approach. And that makes sense when you have the courtyard, because courtyard here and the building form a very interesting interaction. And one is, uh, if there's no courtyard, there's no collection of the buildings. Building has no collection at all. But in the meantime, the buildings help to define courtyard. So that means building and the courtyard, they rely upon each other to define. But in the meantime, they are against with each other. Because courtyard is open space, or the building is a solid space. So that brings a very in interesting spatial experience. That means from one courtyard to another courtyard, you have to go through buildings. Well, from one building to another building, you have to go through courtyards. So that means the courtyard and the building become each other's interface. You have to make that inter alternative ex spatial experience to to make the connection. And that is a very interesting interaction between these two important spatial elements. So now in this major old mosque, we have five elements here. And here, I think one of the major arguments we, we bring here is uh, this courtyard is play a dual role in here. It's like a, I call it dual agent, but that means it's like a dual spy agent, it means spatial agent. Because in the here, courtyard separated space. So that means each space have different functionalities with different spatial characteristics, with different spatial meanings. It's a separate. But in the meantime, courtyard make all this space connected. So that means courtyard play both the role of being shipped split away while putting things together. So that is a very interesting meaning of 
courtyard. And because of that, a very interesting outcome come out is layers. Because of the courtyard split space, it's created layers. But not just layers, it's a series of layers. And the layers, well, oops, the layers will create a hierarchy, special hierarchy. And the spatial hierarchy will be used to represent social hierarchy. So that means the layers define distance. The spatial distance define our sp social distance. So that helped to create this spatial hierarchy for a religion's building. And here you can see from the entrance point, which is the first courtyard, go all the way to the west. The hierarchy become more and more important because the last one is the prayer's hall. And all the direction is, is the point to Mecca. So that is the you know very important in the meaning of Islamic. Another thing we want to quickly talk about is uh, the layers also help to create a separation. The separation is, uh, think about this, when Islam has been introduced to China, China already has a well-established civilization. So that means uh, Islam is the minority. Mostly are minorities. So they want to create a clear division. This is a mosque, and outside is the another long Islamic space. And the courtyard make that separation happen. So now let's talk about something interesting here is, uh, even though there are a lot of Chinese spatial elements has been used to deliver, you know, we are local, we are still, you know, engaged with your local life. But there are a lot of changes has been made to, to accommodate the needs of Islamic religions, activities, and uh, uh, other special meanings. The first important thing is the east-west access. Because of this, uh, you needed to point to Mecca you know, the, the direction. So that is very different from most Chinese building in Old Town, which is north-south access organized. The second thing is um, in most of Chinese courtyard building in history, there is open space. You don't really have any of the structure in the center. But this Moscow have the, some, always every single courtyard have a major structure there because that is used to, to deliver some of the Islamic needs. They need to create that centralization, central point. And uh, also, mixed use complex. Most of the Chinese courtyard are used for residential or for a government office, but the courtyard itself doesn't quite deliver a mixed use functionality. But this, as we discussed many times in those two days, Moscow is not just a religious worship place. It's a place with a lot of other functions, community centers. So it's very interesting, like this language. This is located in the first courtyard. This is a gateway, the wood gateway. But this gateway normally used for old Chinese school. However, this language has been brought to the courtyard here. What does that mean? That means this is a mosque, but in the meantime, it's over education. So for non-Muslim Chinese, they know, oh, I could send my kids to take a class over there because they offering education. So those are a lot of that kind of a meaning to engage with the daily life elements of long Muslim uh, population. And also this is a, a pavilion. But this pavilion actually is a Chinese version of the mineral. And this Mos uh, Moscow has no mineral, but uh, the mineral was moved into the center of the courtyard, become a pavilion. And also another thing is uh, the prayers hall. Normally, when you create a spatial hierarchy, the most inside one is always highly, you know, important, in the most important space. That is the most private. But which is conflicted with the traditional, China, oh, sorry, conflicted with the uh, Islamic use because the prayers hall is, a, is the most public for the Muslim population because you need to pray here in group. And because of that, 
they create a larger courtyard to accommodate an increased number of the users there. And this is a place where the celebration of the public life for Muslim population, but now for non-Muslim population. So quickly, I want to make this the unique context of the early mosque in China, because again, uh, Muslim is a minority in early China. So that's why they t adopted the Chinese elements to be the early mosque, and that will continue this format until today. Number two, the courtyard is important because they created this separation of the space. They define the Islamic space away from the long Islamic space. So that means the courtyard defines the boundary defy the difference. And also because of that, it's a help Muslim people have the shared identity because they know where is the boundary, where is the edge. We are doing things inside together. That helps to have this mental picture of being together. But in the meantime, the courtyard bring the Muslim together because they make this sequence of the space. So that's why I think, again, it's explained courtyard is playing the dual role, Sep split, separating space while collecting space. All right, thank you guys. I think that's short. <laughs> Any questions? I know, yeah, yes. Thanks. I, I need to understand something about, you said the court does both uh, segregation, if I'm right, and, and, uh, and integration as well. Uh, and there is a hierarchy. Yes. Huh? Uh, can you please elaborate on that? Okay. Um, give me. I can give you guys an example. You know, when we have a wall, for example, have a wall, we have an opening, right? So, when you say, for example, I know a uh, Dr. Hama or Oma is here. He's a dean. But normally, when you need to go to see him, you need to go through a few layers, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot see him directly go to his office. You always stop by his front desk. And then the front desk will check, okay, I will check it from Dr. Omai there. You see, that distance, that wall, is the representation of the social hierarchy. Mm -hmm. When you're going through the opening of the wall, means you are gaining more power. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? When you are be outside of the opening, you are have a lower social hierarchy. When you penetrate the wall and become inside, you get a more social hierarchy. So that means the so spatial distance is a representation of the social hierarchy. That makes sense? Yes. yes. So, makes sense. Uh, can I have another thing? Very, very, very. Mm -hmm. So it tends to, to make social segregation. Uh -huh. However, you're saying here there is shared identity, shared experience, so that tends to make more so social cohesion. Let me, let me further explain that. So the mm, split, the Thank separation you. means we need to distinguish Muslim from non-Muslim. Uh, that will help to define this shared identity. That makes sense? Yeah. And the courtyard makes that happen. Because all the celebration of the identity for Muslim are the prayers hall, which is the most important father inside. That makes sense? So that means for non-Muslim, that is the most private space. However, for Muslim, that is the most public space. So that is a very interesting yeah. meaning. Yeah. Depends on which way you read this space yeah. or who you are to read this space. That makes sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very informative. Yes. Um, this is so interesting to expand on this. I think the question here is really about, and thank you for your presentation, mm -hmm. both presentations actually, uh, this morning and now. Um, the, the issue of um, regionalist Islamic mm -hmm. design, aka Islamic mosque, right, in China, um, I see roots in, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the Ming Dynasty, mm -hmm. in in the Forbidden City, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. uh, that complex that yeah. that of of power yes. as well, uh, transitions of power as yes. you go from the sacred, uh, from the profane into the sacred, right, right. To the, from the secular right. to the to the sacred. So I think we have to um, t take a step back, I think, and understand that culture yes. that it's coming from and yeah. how it's been adapted right. uh, into Islamic language, right? To, That's right. So so the the emperor, and, and again, correct mm -hmm. me 
the emperor's space is now the 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 prayer hall, right? right. The most right. sacred, the most right, and also s high highest social hierarchy. The highest. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating to me because yeah. I, I, I didn't know that that existed. Sure. I think this is an example about uh, the space uh, because the Chinese traditional space is uh, uh, the layout is horizontal instead of vertical. Because normally we call define centralism. How to define that? There are two ways. Number one is to make it the, on the top, which is vertical. And the horizontal is we make it in the center. Deeper. Deeper, yes. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the way how we make that hierarchy by creating the centralism, spatial centralism. And the spatial centralism represents the social centralism. Mm -hmm. So you are in the center of the space, and this, then they refer to socially, you are in the center too. Yeah. Thank you, uh, mm -hmm. doctor. Um, I have a question maybe that will maybe uh, reflect in both presentations. Um, regarding specifically um, um, the mosque today in China. So as everyone knows, in China, um, uh, the Muslims, uh, there's a lot of, um, in some, uh, uh, you know, the minority Uyghurs and so on, there's... Uh, yes, the, the narratives from yes. the Western media. The, I, I, we won't get into the politics, but... Sure, sure. Uh, you talked about, I want specifically to mention what you showed us in the presentation, how the mosque... Um, form and identity shifted. So um, is that, can you talk ab uh, about that and um, what does that uh, mean for uh, mosques in China today? Sure. I think uh, there's no way to get rid of the politics. I think architecture is always a way to represent <laughs> politics. I think in particular one of our uh, presenter early talked about that pol it's a political platform, right? If you recall that uh, presentation. Um, about uh, the uh, Muslim population, uh, the Uyghurs, let me think about that. Uyghur is just one group of Muslim, but not every Muslim. I mean, China has many other Muslim. Uh, the main issue is, uh, number one, most of the narratives come from Western media, from UK, US, Germany, France. But no one Islamic country say anything. I think that's a very interesting thing to find out. Kuwaiti doesn't say anything. Saudi Arabia keeps silent. So from my viewpoint is what truly happened is not represented by the Western media. It's not also represented by the Chinese media. And we needed to find out what really happened. But in the meantime, we need to be aware that Uyghur person, Uyghur people, is one kind of Muslim people. And if there's something going on about them, probably it's not only about their belief, because there are many Muslim population in China, and they don't really you know, get bothered by the government. So that's my first uh, suggestion to know more about that. Okay. Can you elaborate, how many, what's the percentage of Chinese Muslims? Chinese um, Muslim, the uh, Uyghur is one of the ethnic group. Uh, they are Muslim ethnic, but there are some several other ethnic groups. The majority of them are called Hui Chinese. The Hui Chinese is the ethnic group. It's a very interesting because physically, they are same with other Chinese, the Han Chinese. The only thing making them different is their belief because they are Muslim. That's why they call Hui Chinese. So now let's talk about the answer to the question about the Moscow in China. So that's why I, today's, this morning is kind of special. My point actually is argument is a Muslim uh, neighborhood and the mosque, the role of the mosque is always changing. We cannot, because what I feel is a lot of our discussion these two days, we try to understand the mosque from a static view. That means look at this at this moment but we don't really look at how this change over time. So that means, however, the mosque always change over time. You cannot just say what happened in this moment will be equivalent to another moment. So what I discussed in this morning is that, is like mosque is under the changing. Sometimes they get more important. Sometimes it's less important. It's all shaped by the political culture and many other things. Another thing I want to mention quickly is uh, today, these two days, we talk a lot about a uh, woman in mosque or LGBTQ in mosque, you know, this morning brain. Think about that. We cannot talk about those things 30 years ago. 
And why today we can openly talk about that change of culture, change of politics, right? Those things will trigger the change of Moscow. So that means that, I mean, today, Dr. Mohammed showed many of the Moscow example. I think that those are something great because they are showing all those examples are very different from traditional Moscow. And those are examples of we need a change to create a new forms of Moscow. We cannot stay with the traditional Moscow because it's not for today's life, not for tomorrow's life. We, as architect, need to find new forms for Moscow in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, doctor, uh, thank you again. Um, just a quick follow-up. Yes. Um, um, just two things. Um, as uh, The discussions are very important. Um, uh, the mosque is uh, something stable and very sacred to Muslims. It's also changing, but the values are the same. So th despite these discussions, the core values of what a mosque means and what it means for Muslims is the same. So um, that's just something I want to highlight. And just uh, uh, further um, uh, regarding the Uyghur Muslims, there's a UN report that came out that discussed um, uh, what's going on there. So I don't want to get into, uh, against sure, politics. Sure. Everyone has their perspective, but we hope, inshallah, the best for everyone. And, uh, and thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you Professor Chow. Thank you so much. So one last presentation before we move to the keynote speech or, or to the lunch, if you want to stay. We have to take this presentation because otherwise there is no more, no more time left for, for her. Okay, salam alaikum. <laughs> I really appreciate everyone in this room because I know it's a big competition, competing with lunch. <laughs> uh, so I try to be uh, as quick as I can, as brief as I can. and. The good thing about being the, la the last, actually, is that I can actually draw on what has been said. So they already paved the way uh, uh, for my presentation. So um, my presentation is actually part of my thesis, which is like an ongoing research uh, about the Quranic inscriptions, uh, I, in which I, re I actually investigate the role of Quranic epigraphy or inscriptions and their ideological implications in most architecture in the West. So today I'll be just um, tackling some um, points about the universality of uh, Quranic inscriptions. And I know we spoke about universality earlier this morning, but I'll be looking a little bit uh, more closely from a certain perspective, which is the Quranic inscriptions. Uh, so the question to be asked is, what is meant by universal? Um, and typically, what, hap what, what people would do, like they look at the origin of the word, the Latin word, what it means, etymologically, but um, I would do the same, but look at the word in Arabic, and this, and I believe it, it has further connotations uh, related to Islamic art. So if you look at the word uh, universal in Arabic, oh, and in that sense also I, f I, I follow um, the argument of Idam Hanash, who uh, would say that Arabic is the mother tongue of Islamic art that has all its meanings and all its expressions. So I would look at universality or universal from the uh, Arabic dictionary. So it says jami' alami and kulli. So of course there's a lot to say about these three words. I'll just mention very briefly uh, the main relevant aspects or connotations re in relation to uh, Islamic art. So if you look at the word jami', it's actually, it has a direct uh, connotation or relevance to the mosque as al jama the congregational mosque um, that has that where Juma ah is prayed by a group of Muslim as or jama'a ah. but um, but it also means it it has also relevance to one of the 99 names of God which is uh, al jama ah, which Al Ghazali describes as al muallif bayn al mutamathilat wal mutabainat wal mutadaddat the compiler of the similarities the antonyms and the opposites. So in that sense, uh, in that sense, if we look at the, for example, the content of Quranic inscription, it's the Quran, which is the universal message of God, uh, or Islam, which, where repeatedly it's mentioned that it's for all words, and it, where it encompasses timeless and spaceless truths that are able to exist in and express certain times and space. And actually, this explains the consistency of having Quranic inscriptions in mosques for 1,400. Years, so we have, and that's the, that's something to um, to question about. And it also being uh, on the mosque architecture, it actually allows 
the access of truth to everyone. So, uh, like different to some kinds of Western arts, arts which are exclusive to some elite groups or, and so on, or people who can understand them, Islamic art, uh, Quranic epigraphy on most architecture actually allows the message of Islam or God to be um, available or accessible to everyone. I wouldn't go uh, through uh, the theoretical or onto more on the ontological nature of Quranic epigraphy. I'll jump to the case study, which is Cambridge, and I'm, so, I'm sure you're all by now sick of hearing about Cambridge Mosque, because <laughs> everyone is mentioning it. But I'll try to look at it closely through the, its Quranic description. I'll just try to make uh, points that you haven't heard before, of course. So um, it has a very long, di like a diverse uh, history. It has a long history of Muslim population with a diverse. So there are over 60 different populations of Muslims in Cam Cambridge City. And in spite that, there is no, uh, before Cambridge Central Mosque, there wasn't a purpose-built mosque. It was all like converted mosque like the one in the slide. So, and the important figure, of course, if you look up Cambridge Mosque, the, uh, the, 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 like the founder or the main founder is Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, and he's a very well-known scholar for Muslims in the West generally, and the UK specifically, and he's an Islamic scholar, so he's very um, well-known, and he do a lot of publications and talks about Muslims in the West, and of course, what has been said about Islamophobia and Moscophobia, and how uh, these challenges actually um, are reflected through the, um, the, the quality of the mosque architecture. And also, he himself has been suffering from this specific, uh, ethnic specific uh, types of mosques in Britain, uh, like Pakistani mosque and Bengali mosque. So when he, he insisted in his architecture brief for the, for the architects that the mosque would be jama in the literal sense of the word, what it includes everyone. Um, so the uh, Sheikh al-Hakim Murad, there's a lot to say about him, but his identity, and I would argue his identity, or, or, or let's say ideology, reflects uh, many things about the mosque, and it also resonates with the choice of the architects. And there's a lot to say about even the process where these architects were chosen, uh, but uh, let's say just briefly that they are um, Marx Barfield, uh, they are founded by two non-Muslim British local architects who built the London Eye. And of course, because they did, do not have uh, a, a previous experience in mosque architecture, they had to, and they wanted to have this, apply this universal principle. So they, they sought this universality through the language of geometry. Uh, so they had to seek uh, help from Keith Critchlow, who is uh, an Islamic geometer, so he designed the underlying geometry of the mosque uh, based on what he called the breath of the compassionate, which is shown in this at the bottom. So they also tried to seek inspiration from other, uh, from other both British and Islamic heritage. So you can see, for example, the King's Cross Chapel and other, uh, and other mosques. They also they adopted this idea of a calm oasis where, uh, uh, like recalling the prophets, the Salem first mosque. Uh, however, so they designed this uh, column-like column uh, uh, pillars, uh, like, and these actually were the most promoted sustainable, because this is also called the first eco mosque in Europe. This is how it has been marketed or promoted. But actually the mosque, um, the columns, they look quite similar to um, South Korean gym house, uh, gym, gym hall, and the apparent reason, one of the apparent reasons, of course, there's a lot of reasons, is that they are both constructed by the same timber, uh, timber company. So they, they're both the same. So, and this actually questions the idea of universality, to what extent should the mosque be universal. But it also highlights, one of my arguments in my thesis is that it highlights the role of Quranic epigraphy in that sense. So moving to the Quranic epigraphy of the mosque, there are three types of Quranic epigraphy. I'll just go very quickly on, uh, on the first two. Um, so the first one, as you can see, it treats Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, and it was designed by Suraya Sayed. She's a British Muslim, traditionally trained calligrapher. Um, but she worked, she was also a student of Keith Critchlow, so, so she worked with him, the, the architects, and Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad to design the, um, this geometric calligraphy. 
and it's of course uh, it seeks inspiration from uh, Islamic heritage, but it also look, um, relates to the local uh, bricks because they have in in Cambridge they have a, a gold uh, tradition it's called gold traditional brick. Both uh, it has a specific even um, technical construction technique. So they inspire they were it was inspired by that as well. So it relates locally. So it's 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 a public of course it's a public message of Islam, but expressed in a local way through the traditional English. Then the, the second and the, the last I'll be just discussing is the Fascia Monumental Script. And this one was written or inscribed by Hussein Kutlu. He's a very prominent traditional calligrapher, a uh, Turkish calligrapher. And it was brought later to the project for many reasons. One of them, of course, the funding. Uh, and he has very controversial, not controversial, but he is very, he's quite disappointed, actually, when you speak to him. He's quite disappointed with the whole thing, the whole project, the whole uh, the architecture of the mosque being, being brought in late to the project. But anyway, this is not our point. Uh, just looking at the, the message of the, um, of, of, the, of, of the inscription, it, say, it reads, in, uh, in, in, It was actually chosen uh, by Abdul Hakim Murad himself. So, and when you read, when you read his, um, uh, this is what, where I had his interview, you read his rationale in the choice, you'd find that it actually reflects those challenges about the West and Muslims in the West. So he would mention that his choice for this is that it actually, um, a verse that, um, uh, in this verse, like it was God's words to Moses, and Moses is a biblical character as well. So he situates uh, Islam within the Abrahamic religions, as, as he says, and it's also, he, for him, it's welcoming to local people, it's uncontroversial, <laughs> and it is, in the case, Islam is belonging to the monothelistic narrative, which already exists in the UK. And um, regarding the form, the monumental kufik, the, 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 the monumental kufik actually is also familiar to the, to the Western context, to the British context, because it, it's, um, it actually inspired what's called pseudo kufik pseudo kufik is actually something you can see in churches that was inspired by our like the, uh, the kufik the islamic kufik but it's called pseudo because it doesn't mean anything they just they liked it they put it on their clothes they put it on the uh, on i mean the paintings as like uh, a decoration so again we find we, we find a universal message but inscribed in a way that relates to the local uh, to the local context and honestly, I, I didn't have these pictures. Uh, I just added them before the presentation when I saw the presentations of the morning. Okay, these are one of my ma main case studies. And I, as the, the typical question is, if you look at these, would you think it, they're mosques? Probably not. But, um, and this punch bowl mosque, just to highlight this idea, it's actually um, really much inspired by brutalism. And uh, if you don't know much about brutalism, it's like, a modernist movement that was based on values that are actually uncommon to the Islamic values, like anti-beauty uh, kind of roughness uh, values. But and that's why actually these uh, this, um, pictures you wouldn't find people so much. The the the, the, very, the famous the famous pictures are the ones without calligraphy. But what happened actually is that the mosque is actually abundant with calligraphy. It's all over the place. And when you speak, when you speak with the people there, you feel like this, they're trying to Islamize the place, which also, again, highlights the role of Quranic epigraphy as a way to redefine, this is my argument, redefine the Islamic architecture. It's a universal way to redefine Islamic architecture in different, uh, over different, uh, from different perspectives. So we have the universality of the mosque, or we question the universality of the mosque, but we do have an element like the mosque. Again, you see, these are the uh, new modern mosques uh, that were presented even over the last two days. They, all of them, they still have calligraphy, but the problem is that architects, they do not speak much about calligraphy. And you do not find a lot of literature about that. You only find Islamic historians talking about what happened in the past, not necessarily in an even um, interpretive way, just descriptive way. And when you talk about recent, um, like contemporary architects, they think it's not their job. When you think, when you talk about, when you talk with uh, calligraphers, they're disappointed about their position in the process. So I, I believe it's a very important topic because it has a, a very, uh, for myself, I believe it's have a very important role 
But then you don't find people um, even mentioning it or even like uh, discussing it in any way that that it it, it uh, <laughs> and that's reflected on the um, on the on the, the architecture and as well um, the rationale. And because of the West, of course, this uh, what happened uh, the West as a community centers. You find people having a statement in our like Middle Eastern Arabic Islamic world. We don't give much emphasis to the uh, calligraphy because we don't believe that we should make a statement with our mosques. But in the West, you, when I, I interviewed the, the patrons, the calligraphers and architects of these mosques, calligraphy does have a statement and they do use it as a way to, to convey their ideologies, their statements and, and so on. I don't want to keep you anymore. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, we can just have them later. <laughs> I quite like what you specially ended with, with, with different questions that came previously about mosques that do not look like mosques anymore. A lot of contemporary mosques now without the minaret or a dome, you may not know that it's a mosque. And it seems calligraphy and inscriptions became kind of a way to mediate this, because we are in this kind of bigger question, how we build a mosque that is contemporary and not stylistic or traditionalist, but at the same time, it's still a mosque. And I think maybe, as you have kind of mentioned, the way out could be related to calligraphy. Most of the buildings that you have shown, however, seems like the calligraphy is an add-on. It's not embedded exactly in the design. It seems like it's a, a final solution to find a way to make it a mosque. But I think kind of initiating this idea or raising these questions are very important. So thank you for that. Uh, today's session, we have four presenters. We will start at... Uh, 3.05 and finish inshallah around 4 o'clock because we have another main session at 4 o'clock starting in the main theater. Uh, we have four uh, guest speakers, uh, Professor Abdul Mahsin Farahat, and then uh, Dr. Yusuf Al Harun, and then Dr. Uh, Muhammad Zami, and then finally Dr. Muhammad Al Ajmi and Dr. Shao Hu, who they have uh, a joint uh, paper together. So uh, we will start with uh, Professor Abdul Mahsin Farahat. He is full professor in the environmental design at King Abdul Aziz University and a chairman of the landscape architecture department from the, night, from the year 1978 to 2016. He got his bachelor degree in architecture from Cairo University and a master of landscape architecture from University of Georgia, United States and Doctorate of Environmental Design and Planning from Virg Virginia Tech in the United States. Uh, Professor Farahat is active in conducting projects in architecture, landscape architecture, uh, architecture and urban design. And he did uh, many uh, uh, of these projects and he won uh, about 10 international awards, both uh, professional and academics. And he is active as well as uh, uh, writing poetry and uh, among many other things. So Professor Farhat uh, will give us now a presentation, the title of Design Guidelines for the Context of the Holy Mosque in Mecca al-Mukarramah. Please, uh, Dr. Farhat. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, the contents of the presentations are introduction, basic principles, then the thrust of the paper or the presentation, design guidelines for the context of the Holy Mosque, then a design example and a conclusion. Uh, it is needless to say that um, uh, there is huge developments going on in Mecca al mukarrama especially in the central area. And uh, one has to say that uh, there are huge uh, um, services being uh, uh, done uh, by the Saudi government. 
no one uh, should deny that, should never deny that. And uh, a, a lot of good intentions, but the resulting uh, urban environment has a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, politely objections. So uh, instead of uh, focusing on the criticism, uh, this presentation focuses on what should be done. And uh, then uh, uh, we can talk about uh, how, how to do it in future. Uh, uh, the basic principles are three. Uh, fitting the natural environment is number one. Uh, uh, enlightened interpretation of the historic cultural context is number two. And number three is a coping with contemporary aspects, both intellectual and uh, technological. Uh, in terms of the natural environment, uh, before going into the specifics, we must remember the basic concept prevailing in literature about the natural environment which is uh, uh, the intrinsic value, al qima al gawhariya the intrinsic value of the natural environment. Uh, this is not to be uh, calculated by monetary terms. Now, in the case of Mecca al mukarrama in the case of the, uh, especially the context of the Holy Mosque, this is compounded uh, several folds, many folds, uh, by the religious and spiritual aspects related to the place. Uh, because of the uh, um, uh, many, <clears throat> uh, I would say, I don't want to seem critical, but because of the many uh, negative effects that occurred, uh, uh, people tend to forget that the Holy Mosque is inside uh, uh, Wadi Ibrahim, and the central area of Wadi Ibrahim uh, uh, is surrounded by seven hilltops or mountains, making a major space. Uh, this is very important, and the mountains here are not just topographic features. They are reservoirs of history in addition to the uh, religious aspects, the visible history, actually. Uh, uh, this is uh, this shows historically uh, Wadi Ibrahim and its uh, tributaries and the whole of Mecca al mukarrama and the Holy uh, Mosque in relation to it. Now, in terms of the historic cultural context, because of the religious uh, uh, instructions that all of Mecca al mukarrama is haram, uh, the word haram does not relate to the Holy Mosque only but to the whole of Mecca and Mukarrama uh, up until the uh, Sharia boundaries. Because of this, uh, historically, there was no separation between the Holy Mosque and the urban uh, uh, context. It was all one continuous urban tissue. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, uh, re, uh, uh, redraw this picture uh, in contemporary terms, but we must try to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to make the basic values related to this urban tissue occur again. Uh, the urban tissue was uh, further uh, enriched by the architectural sensitive treatment a small scale stepped uh, uh, um, uh, terraces all expressing the topography. So when you look at the urban environment, you don't see buildings. You see an urban tissue that goes up and down and expresses the topography in three dimensions. Uh, Jerusalem, as an example, uh, uh, is also uh, the uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, the Dome of the Rock are uh, in the middle of a basin. Uh, surrounded also, um, surprisingly, by seven hilltops and uh, mountains. And uh, here we see urban design and architectural design related to this uh, major space uh, configuration. The freestanding uh, uh, gates relate to the landmarks, and the landmarks relate to the ridges of the surrounding mountains. 
in terms of contemporary aspects, we have two or three sides. We have the increasing number of pilgrims and prayers and people going to pray. Uh, number two, we have technological aspects. Number three, we have uh, a contemporary thought. Uh, and now, uh, a com contemporary thinking in architecture and urban design. The three, uh, we must make uh, uh, a synergistic effect to uh, enrich the previous uh, two principles, the natural environment and the uh, uh, cultural historic uh, context. We should never allow the reductionist system of technology to impose on uh, the more important values of the natural environment and the historic context. Uh, in the coming guidelines, this would appear more uh, specific. Now, this is the main part of the, of the presentation, design guidelines for the context of the Holy Mosque. The most important aspect is uh, uh, Zamzam water. We don't see it, but it is there. And we should know uh, uh, clearly that it's not just a well. It's not just a freestanding well. The natural drainage uh, 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 um, uh, watershed related to it goes to uh, Altai. And uh, uh, the most effective part is larger than the central area. And it is a rock fracture system, according to geologists. This means that it's not uh, a well-defined uh, uh, basin with well-defined uh, uh, boundaries. No, it's, it's a it's like the blood veins of the human body spreading all over. So it's very sensitive, it's very fragile. Uh, that's why, although these two sketches are uh, very simple, uh, definitely the one to the left, we should never allow leakage from the sanitary system or the storm drainage system. The one to the right is even more important. No pile foundations should be allowed. In my opinion, in all of central, uh, in all of Mecca, Al Mukarrama, but at least in the central area, if we prevent pile foundations so that you don't penetrate into the layers carrying zamzam water, and if you limit the basements to two, then automatically you would limit the height of buildings. To uh, uh, that will go along with all uh, the next. Uh, design, uh, urban design guidelines. Uh, minimizing cut and fill to conserve correct uh, features. Now, the heights, uh, uh, um, uh, um, in addition to what I talked about in terms of uh, preventing pile foundations and minimum and maximum of uh, two uh, basements, uh, it is recommended that the height of the buildings facing the Holy Mosque should not exceed the height of the Holy Mosque, which is around 21, 22 meters. The height of the highest building on the ridges should not exceed 50% of the height of the minaret or 50% of the height of the mountain, whichever is shorter. The height of the minaret is about 96 meters. So it means maximum height should, uh, should not exceed 48 meters. Now, distribution of land uses, uh, public, commercial, and services will be, will be on the wadi uh, uh, side, uh, residential on the slopes, residential and hotel on the uh, ridges. In this way, you compensate the height with the value of the investment. So it is fair, it is fair for fair investment. It is never enough for greedy investment. Uh, you can increase the overall uh, uh, efficiency by uh, having some proposed roads in the middle of the urban mass, but these roads should not be for conventional vehicles, should be only for electric uh, battery operated uh, vehicles so that there is no uh, pollution. And instead of the conventional uh, uh, skyline, which is the highest near the mosque, 
and the loop uh, further away from it, we uh, 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 do the reverse. We reverse that. Uh, distribution of building masses and spaces should be done to maximize views and spaces should be part of the uh, design, should be a very important part of the design. This should be, this sketch, uh, keep it in mind because it relates strongly to the following two uh, other uh, sketches. Uh, player areas should be distributed within the urban fabric. Uh, uh, in the Holy Quran, it says, للطائفين والركع السجود. So he mentioned the al-ta'ifin first, and then the people praying. And the people praying can go even to the uh, limits of the uh, Sharia boundaries of all of Mecca al mukarramah uh, gaining the same reward, the same thawab. So praying does not have to be inside the Holy Mosque. Only tawaf and sa'i has to be inside it. So in this way, we can increase the capacity of the Holy Mosque uh, two or three times or even more. Uh, uh, and all over Mecca, but especially in central area, you can have uh, open spaces with different treatments for shading or can be done. Visual contact with the Holy Mosque, people will not feel that they have to go to the Holy Mosque. And the Holy Mosque would be less uh, crowded than it is uh, uh, today. And we would gain a more humane environment. <clears throat> Accessibility to the Holy Mosque on one side and to the uh, uh, urban uh, context uh, on the other side. Uh, in relation to the Holy Mosque, it is recommended to access, uh, access it from the roof, not from the ground. Uh, right now, the ground floor is overcrowded and the roof is underutilized. So if you do the opposite, first you will you would enforce uh, what I mentioned in the okay, bridge-like buildings. The design example uh, uh, is actually um, a project done by uh, King Abraziz University in a limited uh, international competition, uh, 20 participants, including SOM, etc., we obtained uh, the first prize. Uh, I was the design uh, coordinator, uh, coordinator, and we applied the same principle. The maximum height did not exceed 50% of the minaret, nor the uh, height of the mountain. And every room, not every apartment, every room overlooks the Holy uh, Mosque. Their areas are distributed in major plazas, small plazas, and pockets. Um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, yeah, the commercial uh, area at the bottom. Okay. Uh, Professor Can Farhat, you see the shared screen yeah, now? Professor Farhat, we have to end up now uh, because uh, the time is over now. Uh, we, we can leave the, uh, the questions, inshallah, later on. Uh, our okay. Our nothing like live presentation live. Our next presenter is Dr. Yusuf Harun. Uh, he he teaches at our uh, university college of architecture. Uh, Dr. Yusuf he also has and owns and manages his own architectural firm called Illuminate. He has a bachelor's degree in architecture from Tulane University and a PhD from the University of Sheffield. UK. Uh, Dr. Al Harun's expertise lies in the sustainability and contemporary vernacular architecture. And his lecture today is called Designing a Sustainable Mosque Prototype for Humanitarian Relief Areas and Refugee Camps. So please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Adil, for the um, um, introduction. Uh, so my, um, uh, let's say, uh, presentation today is entitled Modular Mobile Mosque um, Prototype as a Social Cultural Incubator. And so uh, to start, I would like to um, just um, raise the question of why uh, to design a uh, modular um, mobile mosque. 
And uh, to do that, uh, we need to break down um, uh, the meanings of modular. So uh, modular uh, means employing um, and involving more uh, of one module, and um, uh, and that's uh, uh, let's say components uh, uh, of a building construction. And mobile, everyone knows, is something that um, is uh, uh, easily to transport and move. And a mosque, everyone knows, um, is our uh, place of worship for Muslims. So um, the the, uh, the uh, let's say main let's say push towards this research came to see images like this. Um, this is in Rohingya uh, camp in Bangalad uh, Bangladesh, and these are refugees, uh, and this is the, where they're praying. Um, uh, they're, they made up a um, makeshift uh, temporary structure, and they're using it at their mosque. Um, some of them, if you don't have the um, av uh, ability to build that structure, and you could see they're uh, praying in the, uh, uh, the open sky, and uh, uh, their house is uh, behind that. Um, this is another uh, temporary um, mosque uh, in the Syrian refugees in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. And also uh, very unfortunate to see um, the, 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 the not uh, only aesthetics, but the quality of uh, spaces where they need it most. Uh, you could uh, notice the uh, minaret has been reduced to a speaker system and um, a water tank uh, in the front of uh, the, the entrance. Uh, this is other images of different... Um, uh, the modular uh, prefab mosque structure, uh, uh, also uh, temporary systems found in um, Africa and Asia. Uh, this is uh, another um, uh, temporary structure, and you could see also um, how the air conditioning units uh, are popping out. Uh, the uh, evolution uh, uh, spaces are uh, very next to the uh, entrance, and overall, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, not at standards um, of mosque uh, design and um, uh, high quality finishes. Uh, maybe this is one of the better examples. Uh, so this is the mobile mosque truck, mosque truck uh, found uh, uh, and was designed for the Tokyo Olympics. And so basically this uh, is really uh, nice. If maybe you guys uh, have uh, had the opportunity to see this, it was in a lot of uh, 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 in the social media in the last years or two. Um, and uh, so the idea in this uh, truck just uh, could go anywhere it uh, wants and just pops out uh, and uh, ch uh, becomes a, a moving uh, mosque. And it's used really nicely for sports venues and also for other uh, 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 events. So maybe this is one of the better examples of uh, uh, what I found. Um, but uh, we as Muslims are definitely not um, doing enough uh, to provide um, a, um, a prototype for these kind of um, spaces. And uh, also to bring back what's missing, um, a, a multifunctionary uh, community center. So uh, the inspiration behind um, the, the proposed design we'll, uh, I'll show everyone today is um, uh, the um, uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallam's mosque in Medina. And um, so this mosque, um, uh, as everyone knows, um, is a very simple structure, uh, beautiful and simple. And it's the um, basic of all uh, mosques that we know of today. So it's towards uh, al Jibla and Mecca. It has uh, the Liwan or, uh, or columns and uh, the open space, which is the Sahan or al Hosh. And as you can see, it has more than one access. And Al Bayt Rasul is is next uh, door. So um, using this as my inspiration, um, I try to. Um, uh, 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 find the, uh, 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 or let's say, um, re um, use the following objectives um, of um, having a multifunctional space, uh, promote social uh, programs, uh, local cultures, practices, and understandings, and also uh, have a, um, a, um, a new, let's say, uh, social cultural incubator uh, uh, as my idea. And so this, what I mean here is a creative and cultural um, incubator operate as reference points to explore and expand on dimensions of art, culture, and social enterprise. 
So the purpose of these um, incubators is to um, stimulate the members by offering them opportunities to learn, create, and, and grow. Um, and um, this is very much needed um, uh, in the areas, as you could see, the refugees and, um, and humanitarian disaster areas. So my research methodology is using research by design. And um, that uh, is an idea uh, that was coined in Frailing in 1993. And so it's an iterative process where the design itself uh, feeds back to the research and the research back to design and it and continues feeding a loop until the process uh, uh, is, uh, and the product, final product, uh, comes closer to uh, the objectives. Um, so um, an easy way to say it is Zimmerman and uh, Flores, they defined it in an approach uh, that uses different practices and methods and generating new knowledge. So this is a really quick um, uh, uh, breakdown of the research um, uh, methodology. Um, as you can see, the design stages, construction, and final products are looped together. So going to um, the, the design, I'll start by uh, talking uh, and saying uh, wha uh, yeah, uh, what principles did I follow. I followed the, uh, the um, uh, mosque as community center, uh, modular components, and mobility uh, and sustainable strategies. And uh, the b benefits of, of uh, modular design um, allow the variety of spatial arrangements and uh, flexible and adapts uh, as per uh, different situations in the ground is fast, efficient construction system and has a lower uh, uh, transport and construction cost and, and achieve uh, sustainable costs uh, as per uh, UN uh, and UNHCR initiatives. So um, these are the potential areas where this mosque could be um, uh, deployed. So I use deployed because I'm trying to align uh, and what we're all trying to do in this conference is change the understanding of what a mosque is in one way um, uh, it's uh, stable, and uh, one way it's also changing for the times. And this is much needed at this time uh, with wars and conflict and uh, the, the vastness of, of, of what we see in, in, in real life. And sometimes we just need it uh, where it should be. And, and this is um, a proposal where, inshallah, it will help in these spaces and this, uh, pl uh, in, in, in these areas. So uh, the idea is basically, uh, as I said, inspired by Muhammad Salah al-Islam's mosque in Medina. And uh, it's divided into the men's hall, the women's hall, and this men and women segregation could be uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interlace or uh, in a mashrabiya or something very uh, light. It's not, not uh, nothing heavy at all. And um, women's abolition, uh, uh, men's abolition, and so there are different entrances, as you could see, and uh, courtyards uh, uh, areas that could be designed. So this is a, an axiometric view that could startly uh, show how this could be put together. Uh, elevation. And um, a slow breakdown in how the um, mosque could be uh, carried uh, into where it needs to be in containers. And um, uh, assembled um, uh, into toolkits and put together uh, in this final uh, uh, place of, uh, and uh, the the variations and the um, and the diverse uh, uh, different, uh, uh, let's say configurations is so um, many that as you can see, this is only a few uh, where the dome and the minaret could take uh, uh, a larger uh, uh, form and function, and uh, spatial arrangements could differ depending on the need and the function on the ground. And uh, to conclude, um, I would like to um, say that this prototype is an evolving idea. It's a research through design initiative. So that means the research uh, and design is very much interconnected. It's one idea that is connected. And um, uh, this is the first phase. So the second phase, inshallah, would be the construction. And after that, it will feed back to the design itself and uh, hopefully get a better final product that we could, uh, inshallah, uh, use uh, uh, with more confidence. And so um, I hope that this um, initiative and proposal uh, will bring back a more leadership and multi-functional role in mosques uh, and uh, um, give uh, people more hope where they need it most. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Youssef, uh, for being on time. And we will leave the questions at the end of the session, please. Uh, our third presenter, Dr. Mohammed Zami, 
Uh, he is an assistant uh, professor of architecture at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Dr. Zami earned his bachelor degree from uh, Kulna University of Bangladesh, a master of philosophy uh, from the National University of Science and Technology of Zimbabwe, and his PhD degree from the University of Salford, UK. His uh, research interests include landscape and urban design, earth construction, architectural heritage, conservation, and environmental sustainability and housing. He has published over 50 journal and conference papers in these fields, including several uh, book chapters. He will uh, present to us uh, a uh, title called Crit a Critique of Architectural Design of Jiwatha Mosque in Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Um, I would like to talk about um, a very simple topic. Um, I mean, as a professional, I don't like complicated things. Maybe uh, I've got limited capacity. So it's just a simple mosque. And uh, while I was researching, I was always very much interested of origin of mosque, especially the design element that I was looking at. So since I started working in Saudi Arabia, now it's 11 years, so I was trying to go to the ancient mosques or the earliest mosques. So this is one of the earliest mosques that I found. Uh, before that, I will just showing you the presentation, how I'm going to present it. Definitely, I'm going to introduce it, the topic, and then we will talk about the conservation it, the process that it went through and reconstruction um, status of it. And then uh, what do I find out and what do we learn from it straight that. So, when we talk about uh, the background of this mosque, as you can see from here, um, it is believed to be constructed, you know, 628 CE, most probably our prophet's times, he was still alive. But there was a controversy about it that maybe just after that, or seven Hijri. So you see, this is the thing I told you at the beginning of this topic, that I was trying to learn that uh, how can we learn from the earliest example. And I find a lot of uh, dual opinion or controversy about dates and also the origin of the elements. So um, <laughs> this is the learning I'm taking from this mosque. So. As you can see from the background, that it was really under the ground because this area historically is, is Al Hofuf area. Uh, it is, as you can see, the landscape of this area. I think I have so much colleague here who are from Saudi Arabia, so they they are quite familiar with this area, Al Hasa. So. You can see there is a feature here, very old uh, Jabal al Gara, we say. And uh, from Jabal al Gara, if you climb here, you can see the oasis, uh, the largest, world largest oasis. So it's a very, very significant place in Saudi Arabia that I would say, because it's, it's a miracle to me that how a um, big desert have this kind of green oasis. So this mosque is in this area. So I think briefly this is the background that I can give you that where this mosque is constructed. And obviously, you know, look at the uh, landscape. That means this is the apparently, though it's called Jabal, but it's soil actually. Because withered, withered rock becomes soil. If you look at this ground, these are all deposits of soil. And local people, for the past thousand years, they constructed their structure from these soils. So this mosque is also constructed out of these soils, which is my current research nowadays. A lot of paper on, online you can find that I'm trying to discover all over Saudi Arabia that 
typology of the soil and what best can we do with it? Can we replace the modern material with this material? Anyway, so let's continue just to show you what I say that look at the type of soil. They have fakhar, right? Our pottery shop. Already this shop is located under here, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> under this jabal, there is a shop. I took this photograph and show you that how nice, uh, sorry, how nice this uh, type of soil is that is very possible to construct building out of it. If you can build or make pottery, people drink water with it. <laughs> so water doesn't leak, actually. And this is, this is the picture of the old picture of that mosque that we are looking at. This is the remaining before conservation work. And by the way, maybe this is 200 years old only or 100 years old, people are not sure. But underneath it, also there are other foundations. Because since that time, 628, it was keep on constructing on top of each other. And archaeologists, they discovered all those foundations that I have got a couple of slides I will show you. Again, look at this um, amazing structure, which is, we call it Qasr Ibrahim. It was the capital of Saudi Arabia once upon a time, capital administrative hub, which was built out of this mud as well. Up to now, it exists. Such a rich, you know, building material, and you know, uh, you look at the also the souk. This is Kaisaria souk, still exists, made out of this mud, and this is the wall of the city, historic. Uh, so, what I am trying to establish here is that this is part of the culture. This is part of it, of this area, you know, this material, and where this mosque was constructed. So what do we learn from here is that it is important to recognize and appreciate the significance of preserving architectural legacy. We have to respect that. And the sociocultural situation, why? Why do we need to actually um, conserve this? Because of the new generation, our future generation, to appreciate it. Uh, how do the future generation appreciate it? If we can reconstruct it in its original form, if we can reconstruct or conserve the previous or old structure in its original shape, then we learn from it that what the culture was. But if the conservation work goes wrong, wrong image, then that means we are transferring the knowledge to the new generation wrong. You see, this is I'm trying to establish here. And this is the whole point why I'm involved in this research, to bring back that what we can. So this is a couple of slides I'm going to show you the before the conservation work, how it was. Uh, this picture. These pictures will clearly show you that how archaeologists they discovered the earlier foundation. As you can see, if you as you go deep down, you will find more foundation from 628. And actually, archaeologists, I talked with them, whoever was involved, they said actually they managed to go deep down, several several uh, um, foundation, and it as they go down, they found thick foundation as it becomes thinner in the upward. So what we are learning here from the archaeologists that yes, they tried their best to find it. I want to just to highlight, because this is a critique of the design of this mosque, the openings inside is very narrow. It's for one people, as if this is a service entry in architecture. You know, service entry, only one person goes 600 millimeter. <laughs> And this is the mehrab, older mehrab found. Um, but uh, archaeologists are not sure how old it is. So, but this is found. 
So the main person who was involved in, uh, with this um, archaeological excavation was Dr. Mogannam. And uh, I, I did not manage to talk with him, but he, his team members, I talked with him. So according to him, the, the mosque might have looked like this or this. It was a reconstructed view according to his experience, you know. He's saying that, well, there might be a vault on the top because Roman people were there before, so they might have learned from them. And why he's saying so? Because during his excavation time, he found some gypsum, gypsum deposit underneath, which might be used for that uh, type of vault. At the same time, he's not sure. He said it might be like that, and uh, the roof was constructed with a typical uh, you know, Arabian uh, roof, uh, which is palm beam with mud and palm leaves. So the current state reconstructed like this, which has got a lot of <laughs> criticism about the construction uh, work uh, or the quality of the work. Internal arrangement is following the original foundation, but the building material is replaced by the modern material, uh, concrete and brick, but plaster is mud. That's why you can see mud is coming out. Uh, these are entrances. This is an entrance for the imam to access. There's a staircase to go up to these bastions or castle, you know, corners. And these are other views or other picture of mehrab, windows, corner bastions, steps to go up. I asked why step. They said, well, they found some step underneath. So they just put those steps. But that that actually not coinciding with the type of roof of vault. Because if there was a vault, then there, there's no point of going up. Anyway, there are, uh, there are assumptions from the archaeologist, you know. So these are other views, current views of that mosque. Water. I asked about this, you know, gutter. <laughs> then they didn't have any clue. But I, I, I assume that it is taken from the you know, Kasar Ibrahim nearby, so uh, that image. Yeah. So finding, main finding, I will just conclude my time is running out. <laughs> that, uh, but the paper is there, so you can always read. I will just mention that, you know, it was constructed in its original form in terms of uh, foundation. Um, construction technique, brick. There is a big thing that we learn is that the local skill is lost. Construction, mud, earth, with Arab uh, uh, people who were there to how to build it. There is a technique. It is lost. That's why they were using the modern material. Function, well. The uh, one of the function I think I will really mention it is that literature clearly say it is a Juma mosque, but it is not originally Juma mosque. It was part of the Qasr, which we see at Umayyad time. So it's not a Juma mosque. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that Jawatha mosque was not only serving as a mosque, but it was a castle too. So you see our conference theme, it goes beyond, it crosses the culture, you see. And origin of origin, you can see the minaret origin that we find in the literature might not be what we found. It might be coming from the castle bastions, you know. Uh, some people say bell tower of the Christian people of the charge. So uh, it might not be, because this, the, this mosque shows that it is not. It must be from the castle. And last thing that I would like to mention is that 
The conservation work is not alone the responsibility of the archaeologist. Archaeologist, architect, civil engineers, all the professionals has to be there if we want a successful conservation work and the real correct image. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Xiao Hu, uh, Associate Professor from University of Idaho, United States. Uh, he teaches architecture and urban design. Uh, Dr. Xiao completed uh, his PhD and a master's degree uh, from University of Nebraska and a bachelor's degree from Chongqing uh, University in China. He is also a licensed architect in China. His interest focuses on urban sustainability community development and architectural representation. Is he here? No. Dr. Xiao, not here? Khalas? OK. Well, uh, I think his co-author, is uh, Dr. Mohammed Al-Ajmi, is not here as well. So uh, this will leave us with about 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, so if you would like to ask questions to our presenter, uh, Professor uh, Farahat and Dr. Al-Haroun, and Dr. Uh, Zami. So please, if you'd like to come over. Sorry. Yeah, two seats. <laughs> yeah, we're only two, the other guy online. Yeah, the other guy online, so that works very well. Okay, okay guys, any question? Would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, thinking of uh, Al-Aqsa Oasis as a thriving oasis at the time of the Prophet, and uh, uh, it's well known that they did go to Medina and they bayau uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why should they have a castle there? I mean, what's, uh, wh how could you conclude, how did you conclude that the uh, mosque was also acting as a uh, castle, castle, yes. Uh, should I answer? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, actually, the, the tribe um, is Bani Abdul Qais. They are the one who uh, initiated this construction. Uh, I was told by when I was conducting the interview for the local people, they said this tribe, uh, Abdul Qais, they, they went to Prophet Muhammad to ask his permission to build uh, a mosque. And uh, that will be the first mosque in Bahrain because this place was called Bahrain at that time. And uh, this is the permission they are given. But what the archaeologists were telling me is that the concept of this image of mosque was not there, what we see today. So the mosque, this is the similarity between this concept of this paper with the concept of this conference is that it is beyond its cross-culture, other activity related to the mosque. So this is the reason. It's not exactly soul castle, but other activity with castle, also defensive also. Because I think we know also uh, history of Karmatians. They were also involved in here. So as, as you can see, when you talk about Karmatians, you know, you always they get this <laughs> late, yes. But the origin, we are talking about the origin of uh, Bani Abdul Qais, you see. So this is the history I found from the local people, that they say that even Hazre Aswad, the history of Hazre Aswad, which is related to this mosque, it was told that the, mo the stone was taken from Makkah and kept here for 20 years before it was ransomed. Yes. 
This is called, uh, يعني, this is old Hajar. Hajar yes. was the old city in the Prophet time. And you know this mosque was the, uh, يعني, the second mosque that hold the Jum'ah Jum'a prayer. prayer. Yes. Yeah. And uh, يعني, I doubt that this is this ca- castle يعني, form, as Dr. Saleh said, it was known at that time because mm-hmm. nobody really knows the uh, architectural style in Al Hasa at that time, but definitely it was influenced by the Persian architecture because exactly. you know the the pointed arch was well known in the whole region, not just long long <laughs> time and yes. continued for long time, and uh, I am sure that the area was يعني, uh, was influenced by the Persian architecture. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if the, the in the Persian architecture they have this kind of uh, castle. Okay, you know it was recently built. It was yes. it was not uh, the original. Yes. The the older one was in the top of this one, and they when they start making excavation, they discovered that the original mosque it's beneath. beneath. It's under under the uh, uh, existing mosque, which was thought it, uh, it is the original mosque for many, many, many years. Yes. And then they demolished the, the old mosque and they found the uh, foundations and then they let their imagination to work <laughs> and they cre- created this kind of architecture. I don't know from where they get it. Yes, I think I have mentioned it in my presentation and my last sentence that when a conservation work is done. It is a group work. It's not only archaeologists. Thank you for, you know, Dr. Meshari to mention this, that they have imagined. He said that. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, actually, I, I, I said the same thing. Just for the time limitation that we have uh, time for one more question, please. Well, no one? Well, it's almost four o'clock now, and maybe it's time to go to the uh, the other lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so like a very so interesting much. topic. Yeah, very interesting. Very <laughs> interesting. <laughs>